You're on your way home. It's been a long, frustrating day. You've brought food for your stressful family in hopes of pacifying them with a small portion cup of hot sauce at the top of your bag, subtly sliding on to-go containers. You're steps away. The door to your apartment complex is right there. But you've walked past someone, an upright older lady you're half familiar with, whose gaze should evoke friendliness but instead evinces judgment. Or does it? She catches your ear with a comment you're not even sure of. It's something about the weather. Yes, yes, it's starting to cool down, you reply. You're shifting, shuffling to remove an earbud, but you have to be careful. They may fall out of your ears because they hardly fit. She's saying something again, you're missing it. You have to be careful. You move your bag to your right hand. You reach over to the left earbud. It's always the left earbud. Too hastily, and it falls out. You reach downward instinctively, panicking to pick it up and wipe it off. You don't want bacteria in your ear. You have to be careful. The bag tilts. The hot sauce falls to the floor. Your white sneakers. Your nice white sneakers. They're stained. She lets out a reactive, oh, as you now scramble to move it away to get the situation together. After you pick up the sauce container and scurry to a nearby trash can, squirming with inexplicable apologia, she's already moved on. Is that hot sauce? She asks. Yes. Oh, okay, she says. She says she doesn't like hot sauce. All you want to do is scream that you don't care. But you look crazy, and God knows the last thing you want to do is look crazy. You tell her that you like hot sauce, and you enter the building, and you take the elevator, and you crash into your apartment, ready to cry, unsure why any of it had to happen, or why any of it matters at all. So this is a random one. <laughs> Infamously, Twitter is known to be the stomping grounds for a wide variety of discourses, sound and fury, signifying nothing. A recent one that caught my eye was one about small talk. Is small talk good or bad? Is small talk part of a necessary social ritual that brings people together? Or is it just a way for people to posture as polite, effectively conditioning people to self-report as fine and normal? I know what you're thinking. What? Stick with me here. In this video, I'm gonna dig into some different arguments from different folks online about small talk. I will dig into what makes small talk so unbearable apparently for so many people and the trickiness of discourse about ableism when it comes to social rituals. Yes. Hello, it's time for a quick word from our sponsor. Our sponsors help us do this channel. Today's video is sponsored by Raycon. Raycon are well known for these everyday earbuds. They sent me a pair and I'm really excited about them. They also have really good sound. They fit really well in my ears. They have noise isolating technology and they're also very easy to use. And on top of the sound quality and the in-ear fit and the really good price, the everyday earbuds have a 32 hour battery life. It's no surprise then that they've got over 70 8,000 five-star reviews. I really like using them when I'm doing chores around the house. Now, I'm very excited to announce that Raycon is turning six years old and In Celebration is having a really cool sale on their website. They're offering 20% off everything on their site with select products at 40% off. And now Raycon is introducing Power Home and Power Tech. If you want to be like me, listening to cool podcasts like What's Left of Philosophy and cool albums like... Um, insert album here, then get some Raycons. Celebrate Raycon turning six years old with their biggest sale of the year going on right now. Hurry to buyraycon.com slash Elliot Sang and use the code birthday for that excellent sale of 20 to 40% off. Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring and let's tune in back to the video. Cool Spidey outfit. Thanks. Bitch, I'm taking calls. No small talk. The most common sentiment you're gonna see expressed when you search the phrase small talk on social media is the idea that small talk is highly unnecessary. Many swear by their own fascination with the big picture, and they feel all this frustration with the contrasting popularity of shallow how are you's and mindless quips about the weather. I literally can't bring myself to just like small talk with anyone about anything at all. I can't. I oh, can't. I hate, hate dude, going time. out right now, just like people, I, I can't, <laughs> dude. I can't uh, do it. It sounds like fucking gibberish to me, man. The basic prompt for this kind of point is that small talk is 
boring, it's unnecessary, it doesn't dive into anything relevant about the given parties' lives, and it's just a roadblock to genuine conversation. In the intro for this video, you were distracted by this random stranger away from doing something that you actually care about, away from the things you actually value, your shoes, your earbuds, your hot sauce, going home after a long day. All for what? For a person to essentially initiate meaningless conversation with you that mostly focused on what they cared about. And that wasn't based on real things that have happened to me at all. But this obviously doesn't represent all small talk as a whole. Most small talk is way less consequential. You're sharing an elevator with somebody, you ask them how their kids are doing, it's fine. There's no hot sauce disasters involved. And this I think represents one of the central issues of this conversation. Small talk can't really define anything specifically to everyone. It is a very nebulous term that defines all types of experiences for all types of people. And generally, we tend to think of the term in the more pejorative sense. We think about small talk as this bad thing that people do for politeness, but is boring and useless. In other words, we have a semiotic conundrum where most people connote small talk as meaning the same thing as bad small talk. Justine Kuplin's 2003 paper, Small Talk Social Functions, examines a long history of literature analyzing the necessities and forms of small talk. The body of research suggests that small talk enacts social cohesiveness, reduces inherent threat values of social contact, and helps to structure social interaction. For instance, small talk in service encounters allows strangers to define a mutual non-threatening relationship for the duration of the exchange. If you've worked in service, you know the value of being able to have three polite seconds with somebody before giving them their order or something. Shout out to all my ice cream associates out there. Kuplin denotes that this general maintenance of sociality is something that's derided by the culture we live in that prioritizes ideas of productivity and success. If the term small talk has not come into prominence, it is because it is the overshadowed antithesis of real, full, serious, useful, or powerful talk. Real talk is talk that gets stuff done, where stuff does not include relational stuff. Within this ideology, sociality is marginalized as a small concern, and language for transacting business and other commercial or institutional instrumentalities is foregrounded. And that's one part of it, is that small talk for a lot of people is not valuable because it doesn't add to their life in some way, like the way negotiation or networking might be. But then that reveals a kind of problematic idea that we have in society that our interactions have to be transactional, okay? Not everything should be about your bottom line. Not every conversation that you have with another person should be fruitful in exactly the way you want it to be. Like we talked about in our third places video or in our video about searching for community, there's kind of more to community than just everybody adds stuff to each other's lives. It's supposed to be about adding to an overall social fabric too. And just in general, other humans don't exist just to make your main character story better, you know? But this is far from the only angle with which people find small talk unnecessary. For a lot of people, it's not so much about the interest or material gain you can get from talking about someone else's day. It's about the actual intentionality behind why somebody is small talking with you in the first place. How are we today? What is going on? How am I? I'm surprisingly well. I got fucking real. When you hear people complaining about small talk, it usually comes down to the same idea that small talk is in some way fake. You ever been around somebody who just like talks and talks and talks and they never like have a moment of silence. They just keep talking. You just want to tell them, yo, can you shut the fuck up? It's not genuine. It's a habit of people just talking to talk. People who are uncomfortable with silence or not interested actually in what the other person has to say, but are trying to perform the role of being a good person. I have a lot to say about this one, so buckle up. First of all, I will say it is absolutely true in my experience that a lot of people talk to you just for their own personal gain. They small talk not because they want to actually hear how your day is going or your thoughts on the weather, but because it's a outlet for them to then be asked by you the same thing and for them to talk about what they want to talk about, to express themselves, or even just to come off a certain way. But is this a reflection of small talk itself or more a reflection of the person or the people in a society or that society in general. If small talk is necessarily facetious, then what does that say about big talk? Specifically, 
are people who want to talk to you about big things, whether it be their career, whether it be existential ideas, actually being more sincere necessarily than people who are small talking? I think it's obvious the answer is no. The proof is in how many podcasts we see of people who sit in front of microphones and say the most generic nonsense about deep issues, talking just to talk, just to sell a book, or how many people slide into other people's DMs asking them questions about their favorite movies or the meaning of life, really with the intention just to sleep with them. You know the answer to that one. <laughs> Okay, fine. Deep talk can also be shallow. And that doesn't mean that small talk isn't necessarily shallow, that small talk isn't more shallow on average, right? Well, it's not like there's a good way to measure statistically how many conversations of what kind are more deep and more shallow on average. But I know from my own personal experience that small talk can absolutely be genuine. I'm sure you will be so excited to know that I, when asking other people how their day is going, actually want to know how their day is going, okay? Because I'm a cool guy. No, but genuinely, I think a lot of people do that. I think a lot of people that I've talked to, strangers that I've talked to, have asked me these questions genuinely and have had very warm responses when I answer genuinely. When I say, ah, my day isn't going so well, I have writer's block, or I haven't been able to sleep much, they continue the conversation from there because they're not being fake. Maybe that's just me, but I think a lot of you might experience similar things. And yes, of course, we all experience negative small talk. We all experience the kind of small talk that, for example, is just basically a lens through which the other person can judge you. So they're asking you like, how's your mom and why your shoes are so big or whatever. Or most frustrating, perhaps, the quicksand small talk that feels like it's blocking you from doing the thing that actually needs to happen, like at a hospital when you're waiting for a prognosis or in a meeting with a teacher when you need help with a grade. I think that the existence of both reveals a deeper truth, which is that humans are weird and conversation is hard and it can go all types of ways for all types of reasons. And it's not just about specific types of talk, it's about the ways human beings understand each other and potentially use each other for different purposes. There's no easy way to define a specific omnipresent type of social behavior to describe the deepest problems in society. And this is especially true when we talk about small talk, which in actuality doesn't have that big of a difference from big talk at the end of the day. How am I supposed to even have a conversation with you about your overall life experience if you won't even answer a simple question of how your day is going? You have to have an entrance into that larger conversation somehow, right? Plus, why are your thoughts about the debt ceiling or your mom more important to me than the freaking weather? It's the weather. Now it's obvious that a lot of the time, these opinions about small talk, when you look at them, are ultimately extrapolations of a person's lived experience, more so than some type of overall observation. When a person tells me that they don't like small talk, I take it that it's because they struggle with it, and that's valid. And although through analysis, we can see that yes, small talk isn't necessarily bullshit and can be very rewarding, it's clear that a lot of people experience small talk as being bullshit. And this can tie back to a lot of things. For instance, if you're noticing that maybe you think a lot of people in general are faking their emotions, are faking their concern for you as not actually caring about what you say or do, you might be experiencing a particular issue in terms of your feelings about life. Or maybe it's a matter of you having a really hard time with certain aspects of social functioning. In that case, a simple measurement of whether small talk is good or bad is not going to be nearly enough to addressing what's actually troubling you. A lot of the response that I got from suggesting and eventually picking this topic from my viewers was about a dislike of small talk that often revolved around a feeling of inadequacy at doing small talk. And a lot of the time, it's true that we maybe conflate something being bad with us struggling at it. But I do think there's a lot of people that would genuinely like to enjoy small talk and to do it more often if they weren't so constantly feeling so negatively about it and so constantly feeling like it's 
Like it's scary, like it's difficult, like it has consequences if they don't do it right. This kind of feeling comes in a lot of different flavors. For one, it's seen in a lot of the introvert content we see online, which is composed of people who identify strongly with the label and the struggles associated with introversion. A lot of people feel that they're introverts and have difficulty as such engaging in small talk with people and felt like they wanted me to actually expound on how to get better at it as part of this video. Now, I'll say that there's a lot of content out there online about this sort of thing, and your mileage on how good they are will vary. This small talk for introverts, part two. Just say one more thing. Let's say somebody asks you, what are you doing this weekend? You could say, I'm going fishing. Or you could say, I'm going fishing. My family rented a cabin on Lake George and we chartered a fishing boat. Which one would you find easier to respond to? See how one extra sentence adds more depth and opportunity for the other person to continue the conversation? Introverts have a knack for simple response, but simple responses can cut conversations short and can lead you to the awkward moments that you might be trying to avoid. So when you find yourself in that conversation, just say one more thing than you normally would say and you'll be surprised by the result. For me, I think the best way to approach getting better at small talk has a lot to do with understanding the function of small talk and then happily choosing either to subvert it or go with that in the moment. In general, based on what we've discussed so far, we can see that small talk represents a way for people to build a type of friendly relationship with others in their community through brief, low-stakes communication. As Coupland writes, as part of the process of fulfilling their intrinsically human needs for social cohesiveness and mutual recognition, people actively recreate the bonding and respecting behaviors in local conversational routines that are the social fabric of their communities. Knowing this, the best way to be good at small talk is to operate with the intention of coming off as a trustworthy, good person who cares about what the other person has to say. Now obviously, that's not that easy. It's ambiguous. And so for me, the best way to go about that difficulty is just by approaching it sincerely. Just genuinely caring about what the other person has to say and operating as such, you know? Instead of trying to perform an idea that you think society has constructed tediously of how you're supposed to small talk, just act in a situation the way you'd want a person to act, the way you think a good person would act in a situation. And obviously that's not gonna give you a 100% success rate, and for some of y'all more than others, it may not help at all. But at least from that place, you can think about then what it is that may be going wrong or right, depending on how often it goes wrong. Because at least 10% of the time, you're gonna find people don't really like you. <laughs> That's just life. But if there's a consistent problem where people keep taking you in a way you don't wanna be taken, then you can think about whether or not you're having an issue. And I suspect maybe some of you have entered that category too. And that's when we get into the scarier part, which is about thinking about whether the other person is sincere or not, or just what the other person intends to do and what they want. How do I know if the other person really wants to know what my day is like or if they're just saying that? And of course, there's no way of knowing for sure. The only thing you can do is control yourself and hope for the best, but be ready for not the best. This isn't that satisfying, is it? Even answering in this way, which I guess is correct, leaves a lot of extra questions that need to be addressed. Because for one, it's not like socializing is just always strangers vibing in chill environments. There's a context and there can be consequences to not being appropriate for that context, which some people are gonna have a lot more trouble dealing with than others. Some people end up getting bullied or ostracized for being weird or being crazy or being rude in a way that they didn't think would have been rude. Sometimes we are honest with people and they take it a negative way and they treat us a negative way as a result. A lot of the folks who suffer the most in these situations are the folks who consistently have trouble analyzing and acting in social situations. This is commonly described of folks who are neurodivergent and some neurodivergent people are altogether fed up with small talk and what it potentially represents. So as is the case with most Twitter discourse, small talk as ableists became kind of a shorthand for a discourse wherein 
very few people actually held that position itself. Like, yeah, some people did tweet that small talk is ableist and horrible. And no, this doesn't seem to make sense because aside from the fact that small talk is such a nebulous thing that it can hardly be described in a way that doesn't involve so many forms of communication. That can also be said of neurodivergency and the neurodivergent experience, which sometimes can find positives in small talk. But a huge part of this conversation is actually focused on what we expect of people in a social situation and how we expect them to look and react when we engage with them in a certain way that we think is normal. A viral tweet from late August reads, Sorry if this is rude or whatever, but I really hate people who refuse to endure even the tiniest bits of small talk. Can't tell you how many times I've walked up to a table at work and said, how are you doing today? Only to be met with complete silence and a blank stare. On one hand, this is a totally normal complaint to have, especially because the person is speaking from the standpoint of a server. You're doing so much emotional labor already in that position and then to be greeted with this complete reticence towards any type of politeness, any type of acknowledging that you're a human in even the simplest way is very frustrating. And even outside of that very fraught context with laborers and customers, it's understandable to feel in other situations with strangers, with neighbors, whatever the case might be. At the same time, it is true that we have to understand that other people have their own struggles and may act in certain ways that we might not understand, but if we did understand, would really make sense to us. Some argued that the tweet overlooks the mental struggles of strangers, either with life situations or with neurodivergencies. One outright called her comments ableist, though I hope you don't mean to be. Did you ever consider that people communicate differently than you do? Then in response to that, someone else tweeted this pretty popular caveat. It's ableist to suggest that autistic people can't do basic politeness in a restaurant. Going to a restaurant means interacting with staff, expecting people in a difficult job to absorb bad behavior while placing nil expectations on customers is peak consumerist exploitation. Oh boy. In this discourse, there are several rabbit holes. Some would argue that for autistic people, in a lot of cases, basic politeness is too difficult to ask for sometimes. Others feel like the expectation itself is too high of a demand for people who have difficulty in these situations. And even though they're able to meet that expectation, it can take a lot out of them, like is indicated in this ADHD TikTok. Why don't you like small talk? Well, I don't know enough about you to formulate the appropriate prompts to get you to talk about the things that you're interested in. Yet, at the same time, I don't know enough about you to know which of my interests would be interesting to you, so I'm not sure what to share about myself. And because there hasn't yet been an established baseline of trust, I'm nervous to share any of my interests, and I'm nervous to ask any questions because I'm not sure how you will take it or if I'll accidentally say something upsetting to you or something that you don't like. But really, all of this boils down to one thing. I don't know if you're a person who is safe. So once you establish that somebody's safe... We can dive into the deepest secrets of the universe and skip the small talk. Okay, then I put the interview section here. So I'll first ask you if you can introduce yourself. So uh, my name is Devin Price. I'm a social psychologist and I'm an autistic person and I'm the author of the book Unmasking Autism, Discovering the New Faces of Neurodiversity. So a lot of my writing and publishing up to this point has been about the experience of something called masked autism or masked autistics, mm -hmm. who are people who usually found out later in life that they were disabled and so they didn't grow up knowing that they had a disability. So they've had to kind of compensate and camouflage their disability to kind of just fit in with neurotypical norms all of their lives. I've just been involved in all kinds of different initiatives throughout the course of my life, whether that is like autistic self-advocacy or also like when I was really young, I was in like school funding reform and then more abolitionist work as I got older, lots of queer rights stuff. I've just been in a lot of different kinds of activist spaces of all kinds of different degrees. So I'm curious what the general feeling is like on your end about small talk. Yeah, I can speak both to my own experience and what we know of the research and just interviews that I've done. Most autistic people 
have a really hard time with small talk. They really don't like it and really don't understand why it is socially mandatory. Part of that comes down to the reasons why people communicate and there being this mismatch between different neurotypes and how they communicate. So neurotypical people or neuroconforming people, if we want to call it that, they often communicate not to transmit information, but to demonstrate or symbolize something. So they'll start talking with another person about something really casual and not that important to them, like the weather, to demonstrate affiliation or to break the ice, to warm them up before asking something more serious out of them, or even to like symbolize their place in a hierarchy, like a workplace hierarchy or something like that. And autistic people, we tend to talk to transmit information. And we want to share accurate information usually. And so if somebody asks a question that they don't actually want the answer to, like, how are you doing? It really throws us off because we think we're supposed to give like a full, complete, honest answer. And it's even more maddening sometimes when people just kind of ponder a question to just kind of some kind of general thing, just wondering about some general topic that maybe is a topic we're knowledgeable about. And so then we give them like the actual facts. And then we only find out after doing so that the person didn't actually really want the facts on the top on the topic. They were just trying to pass the time or right. you know socialize. That's right. definitely my own personal experience too. I used to think people were so irrational and boring and wasting all of this time talking about this stuff that doesn't matter, like the last TV show they watched and the weather and stuff like that. Now that I understand the like social lubrication purpose of it, and now that I know I'm autistic and actually have a little bit more of an interest in relating to other people and understand like what some of the barriers to that can be. I don't hate small talk that much anymore. Now I can understand it's like two like birds chirping to each each other across the trees. Like it doesn't really matter what I say. I don't need to overthink it too right. much. And I think that's a really big barrier for a lot of us. Like we really overthink how to do it right and we try to script it. And it's really not about saying the right thing or being correct. It's about just kind of throwing the ball back and forth. I was also going to mention this sort of idea of scripting, you know, as a, as a strategy for different types of conversation. So a lot of us do fall back on scripting for the same reason that like a kid, the very first time they order at a restaurant by themselves, whether they're disabled or not, they like think about and maybe say to themselves what they're going to say. It's kind of a neutral skill, right? Like it's neither good nor bad, but sometimes there is like a mismatch. Mm -hmm. And what we do see both in people's just like personal experiences, certainly my own experience and in the research when non-autistic people get the sense that an autistic person is really, really carefully trying to control what they say and what they do, they can pick up on that anxiety mm. and that barrier that we're putting between ourselves and other people. And we have a good reason for putting in that barrier, right? Like we don't want to be weird and be treated like we're stepped out of line. Right. But people get really suspicious of that. If you're really carefully choosing your words, people associate that with something that you do if you're manipulating the truth or you're manipulating a person. So there's this weird push and pull going on here where I think it does seem to be really useful to have a few handy turns of phrase in your quiver, you know, these arrows in your quiver that you can pull out, especially for things like professional situations or shutting down rude comments. So if I know I have a family member who always comments on my weight, it might be really good to script a response that's like, we don't talk about that at the dinner table, or I don't want to hear that from you if you say that again. You know, having a rehearsed way to shut something down can be really helpful. In my own life, again, a lot of autistic people, we struggle with being seen as not professional because we're too honest and various other things. It has been helpful for me to script out how am I going to present a concern that I have and make sure that I say it in a more diplomatic way so that I can still advocate for the point that I want but do it in a way that's not stepping over the line of, you know, so-called professionalism. But I think if your goal is to have an authentic, potentially authentic connection with someone, like a friend or a date or a community event, I think that's often the time where it's good for us to move away from the scripting so much and try to actually just let ourselves be present and weird because weird isn't actually a bad thing, you know, to just kind of say what's on our mind. And it can be silly. We can say something wrong and it's not the worst thing. Like, Neurotypical people say weird things all the time. They're awkward all the time, too. There's this idea that small talk is specifically the experience of this 
kind of passive thing that require that almost has a sense of a script because it's supposed to be so shortened and so you know whatever that it, it doesn't allow for people to actually articulate on what they actually feel and express themselves but at least in my experience like the conversation of what, what, what when it becomes small talk and when it's not small talk is a lot more blurry I think in terms of that line because a lot of the time people will like small talk with you ask you how your day is going and then if you're like oh my day was bad and like give like an expressive answer or like a serious answer a lot of the time especially people who are friendly right well people will just respond and you'll engage in a, a larger conversation about that and it can be hard to know exactly like to switch between like oh I this is how I have to act and this is how I don't have to act or how you know how I have to act in this situation unless you have something super conscious in your head of when that's going to happen and when it's not going to happen yeah yeah and I, I've had that experience too of like as I've unmasked more and let myself just kind of be myself in front of people more I've really noticed that like you actually can really open people up to talking about more interesting things even a small talk I remember one time I was on like kind of a first friend date with someone first time we ever really hung out in person mm -hmm. and like they asked like something to me about like, you know, what was your role in the like sibling dynamics in your family? That was like one of their like icebreaker questions. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can tell you about all of the issues <laughs> there, you know? And it was like fun. We could really get into like something real. And I try to do the same thing to other people. If I'm at a party or like waiting for the bus and somebody tells me, you know, what they do for a job, like I try to actually think of what's something interesting about that job that I actually want to learn or like what's something that I think might be annoying about doing that job and like ask them if that's annoying to them. And right. that kind of stuff can actually be kind of rewarding. So I think it is possible sometimes, like you said, with friendly people to kind of right. tip it into a more genuine place. And I think that's an easier, more comfortable place for a lot of us to be in. A lot of socializing just is dealing with ambiguity. So this is kind this kind of goes to a point about sort of the, the description of the issue in a lot of cases and the, the description of the discourse, because I remember sort of when it came to Twitter, the, the, the social media Twitter discourse about whether small talk is ableist, right? I'm not sure if that's necessarily possible, especially given how blurry the idea of small talk even is. Yeah, I, I hate when there's discourse online about ableism that doesn't include class consciousness as a component. So thank you for mentioning that. Right. Another example that comes to mind is when people talk about grocery delivery and like the grocery delivery worker getting their order wrong and that being ableist somehow, as if that isn't like a super exploited person who's statistically a super at risk of right. being sick and disabled themselves. We draw this boundary line of who's a good person, who's a bad person when we're in a bad system that corrupts all of us. And it's very frustrating that people get kind of propagandized into not seeing the strings that are kind of pulling at us. It's really frustrating. Like on the one hand, yes, some of us cannot smile on command or have decided to stop doing that because it is really taxing for us. Some of us aren't verbal or sometimes lose speech. There's lots of things going on where a person might seem kind of flat and cold to an outside view when that's just them authentically being themselves. And absolutely, we should all be aware of that and encourage people to question that reaction. At the same time, time, we do have to show some kind of level of respect for somebody's humanity. And that does mean acknowledging somebody who's serving you in whatever way you can. And I just don't think that the majority of the people who are treating that server in a really dehumanizing way are doing that because they're autistic. I think there's a lot more cultural and economic reasons going on for that the majority of the time. And if anything, most of the autistic people I know are really, really conscientious about learning exactly how much should I tip? How should I acknowledge a server? What should I say? You know, I want to do things right by these people because I know how it feels to be uncomfortable and to be mistreated. There's expectations of small talk that do play out sometimes in an ableist way, like job interviews, where they try and just see if you're like a good cultural fit for the company. We know that that plays out in an ableist way and a racist way, lots of sexist yeah. way, lots of bad ways. But the idea that human beings are going to talk to each other and to try and like break the ice and test the waters. If you believe in any kind of leftism at all, you have to support that. We have to be able to build community with yeah. each other. There's so many forces that are driving us apart from each other. And so buying into this idea that it's like ableist to try and connect to a neighbor or a stranger, I think is really dangerous. Yeah. 
I've just had so many and I'm very blessed because I live in a city and I can like walk around and just like meet people. And I think that's just been really great for my coping and outlook on life in general. And it's not in the sense of like making me less autistic, right? Or like making me socially skilled in like a neurotypical way. It's that I get to talk about to really like weird people who are at a weird place in their life about some weird idea that they have or something that's going on down the street. And like I get to be a participant in life and society from meeting my neighbors and having awkward interactions and fun discoveries. And I think ultimately all people want to be acknowledged and included. And that's why it's kind of funny to say that any small talk is ableist. It just strikes me as odd because especially if you know any any nonverbal people, I can't speak for them, but certainly the ones that I know generally want to be included more than they currently are. And even just lots of like shy autistic people across the board like want to be looped into social interactions more often than we currently are. And so being asked how we're doing or or about the weather or what a fun movie was that we just saw, like these might be simple things, but they're not an, an attack most of the time. They are intended to help include somebody or get the conversation going. And they are things that some of us can practice too, to help bridge that gap. And that's a great thing. And like you said, there is no like winning at socializing. I feel more socially skilled now in the sense that I feel more free to be weird and actually be myself. And I think that's a great outcome for a lot of us, you know, whether we're neurodivergent or not, to just be able to be more real. People are just so isolated from each other now. Mm. And so anything we can do to kind of find that affiliation and kind of lessen some of that tension, I think makes us less likely to do things like call the cops on our neighbors and be passive aggressive and do all those kind of terrible things. So I think there is this really weird dynamic happening on social media among certain disabled and neurodivergent people where it's like we're just encouraging one another to see the outside world as a threat all of the time and ourselves as incapable of doing anything new. I tend to find that's a really common reaction among people who are new to that identity. So maybe they just found out they're autistic and they're still wrapping their brain around it. And they're going through this phase of like confronting all the things they can't do and that are really hard and being really angry at the world for not including them. And that's like a very real thing. But I think that's a stage of development into that identity that we can't really stay in. I think maybe that's some of it going on. I'd rather believe that than believe it's like a psyop (laughs) because there's there's something going on where there's just a big discourse that's like you never want to say or do the wrong thing. if You don't immediately anticipate someone's needs are being ableist and therefore we should all just isolate and not ever take a chance with somebody else. And that's not going to that does not advance the project of like disabled liberation at all. Like we need room to, to try and to mess up. That's what we need. As I wean through all of the untapped considerations, the ways we take for granted what politeness means, the ways we take for granted our own experiences with neurodivergency as true to entire swaths of people, the ways we writhe over mere matters of other people's perceptions of us, I find myself exasperated. What is the meaning of all of this thinking? What are we really trying to do here? Is this kind of discourse going to have any effect on the carceral sanest policies rising across the US, the ways in which mental disorder takes up another foothold as a separate realm of policing and institutionalization, one that disproportionately affects black people and people of color and can be used to institutionalize people who are justly rebelling against unjust governance? What truly is the purpose of discourse? Because it can't be this. John Stuart Mill once said it's better to be a frustrated Plato than a happy pig. Something like that. The thing is, life is really fucking hard. Don't I know it this year, you know? I've gone through some things. And sometimes I really wish I could cling to an idea of who I am and what life is and what I'm supposed to be here. And alongside that, who my enemies are and what bad things they do to hurt me would be easier that way. I've been reading this book called The Ethics of Ambiguity by Simone de Beauvoir. De Beauvoir. De Beauvoir. In it, the existentialist icon assesses the central horror that thought production has historically aimed to address in the minds of socialized humans, the constant change and uncertainty of life. She writes, As long as there have been men, and they have lived, They have all felt this tragic ambiguity of their condition. But as long as there have been philosophers and they have thought, most of them have tried to mask it. They have striven 
to reduce mind to matter, or to reabsorb matter into mind, or to merge them within a single substance. Existentialist philosophers, equivocated with pejorative connotations of nihilists and anarchists, thought of as having declared life to have no meaning, no moral or ethical fiber, since there can be no god and no easily defined path to existence, found themselves challenged to forge a true ethical system for the path of setting one's own meaning of life, since there's no satisfactory external definition. De Beauvoir finds that humanity falls into a series of traps, trying to analytically separate itself from its time in history and its place and material needs. They try to create unconditional values so you can build an ethical system based off of them. They equate the uncertainty to be equivalent to an utter lack of meaning and morality, and that would make everything that they're doing in life completely purposeless. There is no more obnoxious way to punish a man than to force him to perform acts which make no sense to him, as when one empties and fills the same ditch indefinitely, when one makes soldiers who are being punished march up and down, or when one forces a schoolboy to copy lines. For this reason, as de Beauvoir describes of the sub-man, we tend to accept flawed ideas of purposeful living even when we know how feeble they are, actually, because to interrogate those ideas would be equivalent to facing death, facing utter meaninglessness, and some people physically can't deal with that. In response, de Beauvoir proposes that the very meaning of life is to continuously accept this ambiguity, to accept oneself as devoid of meaning and as defining meaning, as subject and object, to accept that one can never be separated from their time, place, and material reality, and that existence is simultaneously infinitely deeper than their situation. To accept that abstractions will never get to the heart of things and yet are necessary for us to live with and transform those things. If one denies the subjective tension of freedom, one is evidently forbidding himself universally to will freedom in an indefinite movement by virtue of the fact that he refuses to recognize that he is freely establishing the value of the end he sets up, the serious man makes himself the slave of that end. He forgets that every goal is at the same time a point of departure and that human freedom is the ultimate, the unique end to which man should destine himself. He accords an absolute meaning to the epithet useful, which in truth has no more meaning if taken by itself than the words high, low, right, and left. It simply designates a relationship and requires a complement, useful for this or that. Discourse is supposed to reach a conclusion right? Like there's supposed to be answers. Or at least it's supposed to help everybody who participates in their intellectual journey to finding those answers. Instead, what we get on discourse today, maybe because capitalism, maybe because of the precise location of these discourses on corporate social media apps that incentivize engagement and social success, maybe because humans are an L. Either way, discourses nowadays seem to fall apart every time. It always feels pointless. It always feels like an exercise in finding an easy enemy. It always feels like everybody walks away completely frustrated. I think this is because we cannot handle the subjective tension of freedom. We refuse to acknowledge the relationships that make up all these definitions. You people always complain so much. Small talk is definitionally ableist. People who complain about other people's reactions are being ableist in some way because they're not considering the other person. What about their context? What about their lived experience? What about if in their situation, they were able to recognize that the person probably wasn't neurodivergent and probably was being a dick? What if there's no way of knowing and sometimes people need an outlet to express their frustration? What if the people that are saying small talk has some level of ableism in it are doing so to point out that we can carry ourselves differently when we do small talk? We want so badly to identify an enemy that is always an enemy that we categorize the complaints of service workers and neurodivergent activists as fundamental to our social ills. We cannot recognize instead how different people rely on different things for survival and comfort. How someone can do something to you that is ableist in that situation but when doing it to someone else is often not. 
The viral tweet could have done better to acknowledge patiently that some people are impolite because their ideas of politeness differ from ours, which is something we don't need to take personally, or because they struggle to meet that standard of politeness because of their own struggles, which we also needn't take personally. But does that truly say something about the person's treatment of people with disabilities? Or was it just a tweet with some ambiguity? And in response to that ambiguity, do we immediately need to define exactly what it is that's happening in the background? Or can we at the very least just surmise things, but not necessarily feel the need to assume and create objective, unconditional rights and wrongs in a situation we're not even familiar with because it's somebody complaining about their day trying to relate to other people? Likewise, the reactions of people with ADHD and autism towards this popularizing narrative of small talk as a marker for human decency maybe could be better about not feeling called out, about realizing that people are allowed to complain about things when they don't understand that it affects their lives negatively, regardless of what kind of brain you think they're working with, and that neurodivergency itself is a construct which lumps in so many experiences that can solely be marked as alternative from the norm, often with the aim of reinforcing hegemony, which makes it impossible for people with such a labeled to be universally affected by a nebulous social ritual in one particular way to the point of it being fundamentally problematic. And at the same time, are neurodivergent people not allowed to complain too? Are they not allowed to question social norms? Are they not allowed to say opinions that may make us uncomfortable? Are they not allowed to notice when they may be incidentally grouped in with bad people simply because their anxiety with social interaction makes them lock up or say the wrong things at the wrong times? Anyway, I don't do both sides isms because it is always better to posit an actual point instead of standing shrugging in the middle of two different ones. So here's my take on small talk. Small talk is good as long as it is done well because small talk when done well is just talk. We should ask people familiar or strange how their day is going because we should care how other people's days are going. We should do our best to be polite, and we shouldn't take it to heart when that doesn't go well because every situation isn't going to go well. And what matters is that we genuinely care about ourselves and the people around us and not that we receive some sort of reward for acting like it. We should try to be genuinely present with people by taking genuine risks in order to hear their own perspective and formulate what works best for us in the situation. Any type of social interaction can become super ableist in the world we live in because the world we live in is structurally super ableist. We live in a system where a class of elites extract all of the resources they can from nature and its inhabitants, and they create ideas of delinquency and insanity and morally right and wrong ways of life that specifically make it easier for them to do that, and then spend vast amounts of money to make art and media and education and law as adherent to those ideas as possible so that we all believe it and respect it enough to police ourselves through it. Rather than spend our time trying to figure out how to call it ableist to talk to neurodivergent people, we should actually try to do a better job of talking to neurodivergent people. Rather than try to act like ableism is something you can make up online to get likes from people who are having a hard time in life, we should focus on amplifying well thought out theory and research about how ableism is perpetuated in our world by people who benefit from its existence, and then try not to participate in that perpetuation because we're good people who care about neurodivergent people because they are people because they are us. I shang Thanks for watching. I'm Elliot. Here on this channel, I do leftist journalism with the help of my editor, Denai. We cover a bunch of different subjects and we really enjoy doing it, but we also could use more support. And so we started a channel membership here on YouTube for $5 a month after hitting the join button next to the subscribe button. You can unlock extra emojis to use in the chat during premieres or live streams. Those emojis are designed by friend of the program, Bfly, who is a really sick artist. It includes this sick Karl Marx emoji and this really cool tea emoji. 
And we'll also do bonus content for members, including members only live streams and do shout outs at the end of videos for all the members who subscribe. We'll put your name on screen and we'll shout out one every video. Whether or not you can support monetarily, thank you so much for your support regardless. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye.